me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him, embraced him, and kissed him. This is the word of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. When I was in seminary, I worked for a semester as a chaplain intern at a hospital in Louisville. It was a level one trauma center, and I encountered there many strange and unsettling experiences. But one reminds me of this story of extreme separation. I came on shift that night, and the chaplain who had been working before me filled me in on the shift. And he said that there had been a man who had died, and I think it was even before his shift, but that the family might be coming in to see the body. Now, it was a normal part of the chaplain duties to be with families while they were with their loved one who had died in the emergency room, but this time lag I had never experienced before. I thought it was really strange that they weren't there yet. Something was just really off about the whole situation. So I went about my shift and wondered if anything would come of it, because I had no idea where the morgue was. So as a new chaplain, I was just nervous about all things. But the page eventually came, and the family was there. I went and found them, figured out where the morgue was, and took them down to view their brother. With a hospital administrator, the sheet was pulled back, and I expected the family to be overcome with grief. Instead, there was a really strange air in the room, and I could tell that they were confused. And they said, we're not sure this is our brother. It doesn't look quite like him. They scrutinized his face and kind of walked around, looking at different angles, pondering him. And the hospital administrator and I looked at each other, not really sure what to do. This was, I think, a really strange situation. Well, we noticed a birthmark, and we asked the family, did your brother have this birthmark? Thinking that if you grow up with someone and are as close as siblings, surely you would know if they had this pretty noticeable birthmark, but they couldn't remember. We didn't know how to resolve this situation in that moment, um, but we suggested that they might contact the girlfriend who had come and been with this man when he had died. And so the family left, thinking that they were going to do that. They were very confused, and obviously there was some separation in their family. I think one of them, or most of them, hadn't seen him for over 12 years. This encounter left me befuddled and really sad for them and for the man who had died. How sad that they were so estranged that they didn't recognize him. 
And if it had been the case that his life circumstances had aged him so greatly that he was beyond recognition, how sad that they hadn't been there for those hard times in his life. Now, I don't know their story, and who knows, maybe this man chose the separation that he wound up with. But I tell the story not to judge their family or to judge him, but rather to wonder if we could identify with them. In fact, I wanted to judge them. Part of me did. But another part of me had to stop and think about my own sometimes wayward brother. And I asked myself, would I recognize him if I were in a similar situation? I knew and felt at that moment that even the intimacy of family can melt away over time and from lack of attention. Now in our story tonight, the prodigal son chose the separation from his family. And it is indeed a story of extreme separation. We don't need to know the cultural and social context to get a feel for what's happening here. The language is a language of extreme. It says, he took all that he had and left. He spent everything. There was a severe famine and no one gave him anything. He said, I am dying of hunger. I think this hunger has something to do with the separation that he's feeling. Because sometimes distance, where once there was closeness, can ache like hunger. It can feel like an open wound. He must have been spiritually and emotionally hungry. His soul was withering as it was away from his home, his family, and his religious community. There was food for the pig, but nothing for him. If we're honest, I think some of us have been there. We've been filled with shame and ready to beg, get down on our knees and grovel for forgiveness from those that we have hurt. And perhaps we've been on the other side, We've been wronged by someone and faced with the choice to forgive or to withhold that forgiveness, which is a hard choice. Now, the father in this story has many reasons, we've been over them, to not forgive this son, but the wonder of this story is that he does not. The son doesn't even have to open his mouth before the father sees him, is filled with compassion, runs to him, embraces him. He abandons all composure. He really lets loose with his love. And this embrace is the first taste of healing for them. It is the love that makes all else possible. There's a feast cut to come later in the story, but it is this moment, this love that sets the table that meets his spiritual and emotional hunger. Love sets the table, and love is the ultimate feast. We, on the other hand, are not always like this father. We're not always willing to cross the distance between ourselves and those whom we have hurt or who have hurt us. But God, like the father in the story, is always crossing that distance to us. And so on this World Communion Sunday, we come to this table of love and remember God's never-ending embrace of us. While we were far off, God saw us and was filled with compassion. God runs to us, surrounds us with loving arms, at the table, we see and experience, we taste God's compassion in the bread and the juice. We taste and see that God is good, very good. And as the son was surprised by his father, he must have been. That surprise and that joy 
should and does fill us each and every time we come to this table. At the table of love, we taste and know that there is no distance between us and God. But the table is not just for us alone. We're not just here to be filled up with ooey-gooey warm feelings, make ourselves feel good. No, our nourishment has a purpose. Where there is distance, as we've already talked about, all is brought close. Each one of us is brought close to God, but in that in-gathering, God brings all of us together. All the lost sons and daughters are united at the table. We're all the prodigal sons and daughters, and there's kinship in that recognition. The table is the great equalizer. The Spirit, though, calls for our participation in that transformative power. And so before we eat, we must reconcile. That is one reason why we pass the peace before coming to the table. Each worship service, we confess our sins and we reconcile. And while we don't celebrate communion at every worship service, though we do here at 2nd at 6, that passing of the peace prepares us to come here together to celebrate, to be reconciled. And so the story reminds us that when facing the distance between us, we are called to be repentant like the Son and to be compassionate and forgiving like the Father. And so if we're going to ever be more like this loving Father, God calls us to close the distance between ourselves and others. Now, we know easily, I think those situations can come to mind, of places in our own lives where there have been distance between ourselves and other individuals, like the family that I encountered in the hospital. We have known that ache for reconciliation, and perhaps we have worked toward it. But there are also deep chasms around us, filling our world, that are harder to see, harder to understand, and harder to reconcile. There are divisions due to class, age, gender, political affiliation, religion, country. I could go on. And recently, I have found myself thinking about the deep, deep divisions caused by race. Jim Wallace has called racism America's original sin. And while it has changed expressions over the years, our culture continues to be steeped in it. Police shootings of African American men come up on the news so frequently that I confess for myself that I am overwhelmed by them. I don't know what to do, but I feel sad for our world. There were three shootings that made the news these last week. Keith Scott in North Carolina, Terrence Kutcher in Oklahoma, and a 13-year-old, Tyree King in Ohio. We live in a broken world. The very air we breathe is filled with sin. And we know that when one part of the body of Christ suffers, we each suffer. Our culture is that younger son who has gone and spent it all on dissolute living. But are we ready as a nation to turn back, to ask for forgiveness, to work for something better for each of us, for all of us, for all of our children? Do we recognize each other as brothers and sisters? Do we know how hungry and alone we are? When we affirm our faith after the sermon tonight, we'll be using an adapted excer excerpt from the Belhar Confession, which was adopted by this summer's General Assembly as one of the recognized confessions of our denomination. It was written by the Dutch Reformed Mission Church in South Africa as a theological challenge to apartheid. 
It comes out of a situation of distance and speaks of the unity of the church being both a gift and an obligation. Something that is real, it exists, but we have to work towards it. The confession states, this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people and groups is sin, which Christ has already conquered, and accordingly that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted. These words of Belhar can guide us as we seek to respond to the world around us, beginning with a place of saying, we don't have answers, but we believe that God has called us to be one. So how might we work to make our unity visible? How might we make the reality of this table a reality lived out in the world in our daily lives? How can we lessen the distance between us all? Like the Son, we must confess and repent. And like the Father, we must be filled with compassion and forgiveness. For this table sends us again and again and again into the world to be, in the words of Isaiah, repairers of the breach. It is not a table where we feast like kings and queens, and stay there. No, we come, we are nourished, and we are sent out again and again, refilled for ministry, for the ministry of closing the distance between us and the world. God has fed us, and so we feed. God has crossed the distance to us and fills all the space between us, and so we are given the strength and the courage to cross the distance. God has empowered us to do this work. We live in a hungry world, and we are called to set the table with love. Amen. <laughs>